All right, let's get started. So first off, thank you all for joining us. Happy homecoming. Uh, today is the last day of homecoming, but we really appreciate you taking an hour of your time to join us for the last official homecoming tour. And yeah, really hope that we can make this an enjoyable experience for all of you. So before we officially start off, let's just get into some housekeeping. First off, congratulations to Berkeley's Nobel Prize winners for the year. As you can see on the bottom left there, Jennifer Doudna, 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and Reinhard Genzel on the right, 2020 Nobel Prize for Physics. Congratulations, congratulations to the both of them for all of their hard work. And I really appreciate all of the work they've contributed to the world overall and Berkeley itself. So now to jump into some of the tour, today's tour will be a 45 minute presentation followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. So if you have any questions at any point throughout the tour, then please make use of the Q&A function down below to ask any questions you might have. In addition, uh, keep in mind that the regular Zoom chat is disabled. So if you want to communicate with us, then please make use of the Q&A function. In addition, there will be periodically some polls that will pop up on your screen. Uh, please go ahead and answer those if you would like. We just want to get a better sense of who is joining us today. In addition to that, if you happen to miss anything, then these are recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel online. Also keep in mind that today's campus overview will be provided from the student perspective. So these students are not representatives of the admissions or financial aid departments. So if you have any more specific questions to those areas, then please contact those specific departments. And finally, if you'd like to check out more of Homecoming, then make sure to go to homecoming.berkeley.edu to find out more. With that, let me pass it off to our ambassadors today, Mo and Bridget. Hello, everyone, and thank you once again for joining us on our very last homecoming tour this weekend. My name is Bridget. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers, and I am a sophomore this year at the wonderful University of California. Um, I am originally from a small town in San Diego called Valley Center, and I'm intended to double major in philosophy and rhetoric. Um, outside of working as a campus ambassador, I am the director of security for a spirit group here on campus called the UC Rally Committee, and I'm also a Bear Talk blog writer, a nice blog that campus ambassadors run and we just update you guys on what we're doing uh what life is like on campus and just every other every other things amazing i'm so happy to be doing a tour with you bridget hi everyone my name is moe i use the she her pronouns i'm an international student from tokyo japan and i'm a second year i'm majoring in conservation and resource studies and minoring in food systems and gist which is like a data visualization minor i'm involved in an environmental professional service fraternity Berkeley St. Farms. I'm one of the managers of one of the student-led gardens we have here. I'm also part of the International Students Association. I work at the Berkeley Food Institute, and I'm also involved in soil health agroecology research through the URAP program. But to start off, welcome to UC, welcome back, or welcome to UC Berkeley. Um, we are so excited to know that there are a whole bunch of different people who are on the webinar today. And so if there's a poll on your screen, we would love if you could fill it out um, so that we know who you are. Um, but just in case you haven't been to Berkeley in a while, here are some photos that kind of show an overview of our university. On the top left, we have a drone footage of the Evans Hall area of our school. Um, in the middle, we have our beautiful Campanile, our clock and bell tower. On the top right, we have a photo of the Campanile in the back with the big memorial glade grassy field and the Doe Library in the back. Um, the, this memorial glade in particular speaks to me when I think about Cal because it is the biggest um, grassy area on campus that doesn't use any pesticides or herbicides and this is a student run initiative. Um, and so it kind of speaks to how the, the drive of students at UC Berkeley and how they are change makers, which we'll be talking about a little later on. Um, in addition, on, 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 along the lines of chip being change chip makers on the bottom left, you have a logo of celebrating the fact that this is the 150th year that women have been admitted at UC Berkeley just two years after its founding. Um, and so we hope that you enjoy, as we dive deeper into the details, we hope you enjoy the rest of our tour about UC Berkeley. Um, so great to see that we have some current Cal parents and family members on the call, as well as some alumni from before around 1970. Um, so great to have you on the tour today. 
All right, to start off, we're gonna uh, introduce you guys to the agenda for today. We're gonna start with an overview of our campus, followed by academics, housing and dining, health and safety, student resources, student life, athletics, libraries and research, and then end off with remote learning. And to start that off, we are going to start off with some history. So Berkeley was founded in 1868, so a long, long time ago. We celebrated 150 years of light two years ago in 2018. That was 150 years of establishment. As Mo said, we are now celebrating 150 years of women. I think it's so awesome that Berkeley only took two years to start admitting women to Cal. Uh, that was way quicker than a lot of Ivy League schools or some other schools on the East Coast. So definitely something to brag about if you think about it. Uh, you'll see that we go by Berkeley or Cal or the University of California. In fact, I've already used all of those names probably in the same sentence. And this is because we are actually the first UC campus. UC Berkeley was the founder of the UC system as we know it today, followed by UCLA, then UC Davis, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why we get to call ourselves Cal or just the University of California, because that was originally our name, we had to tack on Berkeley to distinguish ourselves from the other campuses as this uh, program began to grow. Um, our mascot is the golden bear, Oski. You can see him on the top left picture there. He is the most wonderful bear that you'll ever meet. He is the pride and joy of my heart. And he's very spirited. I love seeing him all the time. He always gives me a great big hug. And every time that I am at a basketball or a football game, he always says hi to me and we high five or play rock, paper, scissors. If you were at uh, the homecoming rally, you'll see you get to you would get to see him play rock, paper, scissors with two of the hosts. And that's definitely one of his favorite games. Um, looking at campus size, we have 31,000 undergraduates and almost 12,000 graduate students. So we are on the bigger side. If you're looking for a big campus, this is a really great place to be. But if our size scares you, I promise you that once you're here you, and you find your little community, it feels like a like a tiny little home, which is actually really interesting. I didn't expect to feel like that coming to, su to such a big school from a very small high school. So don't let those big numbers intimidate you. And then of course we have some very historical landmarks as you can see the Campanile, Sather Gate, uh, Ludwig's Fountain. These are all just different locations on campus that are very uh, noteworthy, very historic, very famous. Thanks, Bridget, for that history. We're gonna go on to talk a little bit about the campus culture and what UC Berkeley is like and its students. And one of the things that is kind of emphasized in, in trying to cat categorize this big student body is that our students and our faculty and our staff, our community is all about being change makers. We challenge the status quo, we are leaders, we have our own passions, we develop what we want to change and what we want to advance and what we, what, who we want to be. And we're really adamant about that on campus. Um, this has a lot to do, ties in a lot with our history. If you see on the top right photo, it's um, a photo of the, how the birth of the free speech movement in the US started at UC Berkeley in the 60s when students and thousands of students organized to advocate for the right um, of free speech on our campus. And even today we have um, protests organized on campus, whether it be like the climate strike last year or protests or wanting the divestment of fossil fuels or divestment from the Mauna Kea telescope. Students have continued to advocate for change both on campus and all over the world. Um, being a leader and also means being able to hold your own institution accountable. And so that really is reflected in the students' passion and their follow through and wanting to address the problems that they see in their local community. Um, and this is something that's started with the free speech movement and continues to impact student life and the way that students organize on campus. We also have a strong community based on compassion, passion, and social justice. Um, there's just a bunch of different clubs and with different resources on campus that, uh, that support marginalized communities and make sure that every student has resources to succeed and to, to support all their education and different opportunities. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that we show our spirit and our pride. On the bottom left, you see an event from a pride event. On the bottom right is a photo of the rally committee, which Bridget, Bridget is a part of, and they hype up the crowd and generate spirit around our athletics and other events that happen at UC Berkeley and are really drawing the community to celebrate the accomplishments of our different students. Um, diversity and inclusion is also a very important part of our campus community. Um, as we, the incoming freshmen are the most diverse set of students that we've ever admitted in the university um, and public service in different ways of volunteer. The well, students volunteer is also a very strong integral way that students uh, spend their time at UC Berkeley. All right, and then on to our next slide. 
Um, you may have recognized that Sproul Plaza from the last slide, um, but that same Sproul Plaza can be not only be used for protests, but also for ways that we show our spirit. So those are the two photos on the left. Um, you can see a peaceful protest as well as a, on the bottom, you have a mix of the rally committee up on the second floor. You have the Cal Band in the back, as well as the cheer team, cheerleading team in the front doing a performance. And this is all just to hype up the crowd and just people walking around and enjoying their day to bring about um, energy and spirit for an event that later that, like probably an athletic event later that day or on the weekend. In the middle, you see photos that kind of reference our state in the world as leaders of innovation and research, as Albert just mentioned, two people on our campus who just got Nobel Prizes. And then up right on the right, you again see a photo of the Cal Rally Committee with Oski, who Bridget was just mentioning, as I personally see Oski all the time, um, whether it be at the library or at different games or just walking around on campus. And that kind of shows just the commitment that students or OSCE has in order to brighten up your day and kind of remind us that we are all at Berkeley together. We came here for a reason and we have something that we're all passionate about. Um, and that's just a really great reminder for when we're on campus. All right, so to look at what's happening now, as you know, we are in some extraordinary times. Uh, Berkeley is actually at the forefront of a lot of things. So when looking at education, we have d d dove into a lot of access and scalability. So essentially what this means is that uh, Berkeley has done a fantastic job adjusting to Zoom learning and being on your computer all day. Uh, the professors and the faculty and the staff, everyone who is working to help the students here is doing a great job of making sure that everyone has access to technology or hotspots, Wi-Fi, whatever they may need to make sure uh, that you can still succeed even though our learning conditions are kind of different. And there are a lot of different remote programs that are still um, available to all students. So if you need any extra help, help that you might have gotten in person, you can still get online. When it comes to COVID research, we are doing a lot of trial testing and then also looking at a lot of biological, cultural, and economic impact. So we are using this as a learning experience, which I think is super cool uh, to kind of make the best of a worst, the worst situation. Uh, we're learning to help better our community and also move forward from this uh, pandemic to kind of be safer in the future and healthier. And, all that good stuff. And then finally, for advoc advocacy and social justice, uh, there's a lot of uh, movement for human rights, anti-racism, and then a lot of movements against trauma, resilience, and preventing burnout. So the students here are really banding together to make sure that everyone's voice is heard, no one is falling behind, we're all helping each other. That community that you see on campus in person is still here over Zoom. Uh, looking at someone through the camera is a little bit different, but just being with all the people that I know and love, even if they are across the US or wherever they may be, it's still, you can still feel the Cal passion and the Cal spirit through, through the camera. All right, and there should be a poll popping up right now. Um, and this question is about asking what did you or your students study at Cal or if you're a prospective student, what do you hope to study? Um, we had to consolidate the different topics and different um, areas of study there, because there are only 10 options, um, but we would love to know what you studied here at Cal. Um, currently, there are five undergraduate colleges, them being the letters, College of Letters and Science, College of Natural Resources, Environmental Design, Chemistry, and Engineering. Um, and we're going to go through each and every one of these colleges right now. I see we have some engineering, engineering majors, as well as arts and humanities. But we are going to go on to our first college being Letters and Science. All right, so the College of Letters and Science is my home college, so I am very excited to tell you guys all about it. It is home to three quarters of the undergraduate population. So this is our biggest undergraduate college here on campus. Um, if you are unsure in what you want to do, or maybe you know that you want to go to college, but you don't really know what you want to major in yet, the College of Letters and Science is a great place to be. It is home to five divisions listed here as arts and humanities, biological sciences, mathematical and physical sciences, social sciences, and undergraduate studies. And between those, there are over 80 majors. So if you're interested in something like philosophy your rhetoric like I am, then this is the place for you. And it also goes into the STEM fields, which are so scary. STEM terrifies me, but kudos to everyone who understands science and uh, <laughs> goes forth into that world. Um, what's really cool about the letters and so of, about the College of Letters and Science is that it actually puts you through this program called the Breath Program, where you are kind of forced to take, force isn't a great word because it's honestly an amazing program, but you have to take five classes that fulfill each one of these divisions here in the college. So through this program, I had to take an earthquakes class to fulfill a physical sciences breadth. 
and it was a STEM class, so I was very afraid. But I ended up being really interested in it, and I learned a lot about our local fault, the Hayward Fault, and how to stay safe in an earthquake, which of course I then impressed on all of my roommates and my housemates, telling them that if an earthquake ever comes, we have to do all of these things. But it's a great way to kind of explore different areas of study if again, you don't really know what you want to do and it helps you have a broader um, education. You learn things that you wouldn't ever have learned before. And then also fun fact, 17 of the 25 Nobel prizes that are here at Berkeley came from the College of Letters and Science. So it's a pretty rad place. Yeah, that's a great point about being able, about these requirements, encouraging you to take classes that you wouldn't normally take. Um, I definitely have taken some classes that weren't really what I expected to take, but because of these requirements, they ended up fitting an interest and kind of guiding my interest. And so I really like the breath requirements. Um, I'm gonna talk about my college, the College of Natural Resources, my heart and my home. It's actually the first college out of all UCs. It used to be called the College of Agriculture, but now it's expanded to include all the, some other environmental issues, um, whether it be forestry or more energy policy, nutrition, um, we, there's also genetics and plant biology, more policy-based makers like society and environment. Um, there, even though there's all these different types of majors and, and environmental issues are very interdis interdisciplinary, the underlying topic within all of these is sustainability and social justice. Um, a lot of the environmental issues are racial issues. And so this is a big part of these classes and recognizing that environmental Solutions have to take into consideration um, the differences in racism and the differences in um, how people live their lives in different policies and different cultures. There's a there's a the motto of our universe of our college is see the bigger picture, make a better world. And while that really put a smile on my face when I was a first semester freshman, just like wanting to tackle on and solve climate crisis, it does kind of give a, a positive spirit when we're learning about environmental issues and wanting to see ourselves as part of the change. Um, yes, that's my spiel on College of Natural Resources. We're gonna go on to the College of Environmental Design now. Yeah, Mo did a great job of describing the College of Environment. <laughs> Sorry, the Co College of Natural Resources. Uh, I really admire them for their uh, like their motto and just everything that that college stands for. And what's really cool is that a lot of that actually transitions over to the College of Environmental Design, what we're gonna talk about now. So this is our smallest college of about 650 students. So if you are looking for that tight knit college um, experience inside of a bigger university, this is the place for you. It is home to only four majors, architecture, landscape architecture, urban studies, and sustainable environmental design. So this is the place to be if you want to build buildings and help the society grow in a more environmentally friendly way. Their motto is to craft ecologically sustainable and resilient, prosperous and fair, healthy and beautifully built environments. Uh, I love the College of Environmental Design. I was actually going to apply to be an architect major until I learned that you have to know math. So that was a no for me. What's really cool about this college is that it is home. its home is in Worcester Hall, which is built in this cool brutalist style, which essentially means that it uses the bare minimum resources to build this building. And this is really cool for two reasons. One being that it's super environmentally friendly. It uses only the necessary, um, the necessary products, so like concrete and glass, which is great for the environment. And then also it helps its students kind of visualize what makes a building a building. So when you go inside, you can see all the wires and the pipes and it's really easy to see like what floors are which and it's not like an optical illusion like those big skyscrapers are in the big cities like in San Francisco or in New York. So I just, I really like this building which is a hot take apparently, but I think it's really cool. And then also, as you can see in the top right picture, they have these really cool maker spaces, uh, these huge studios where you can work on your blueprints or do the math that's involved, whatever you need to like do these projects that happen inside the College of Environmental Design. And it's just a really cool place to be. I hope, I hope that someone out there is interested in joining this college because it's so cool. Another small college that we have on campus that kind of fosters a tight knit community is the College of Chemistry. It has only about a thousand students and offers three majors, them being the ma whoa, chemistry, chemical engineering, and chemical biology. Um, this college is also ranked number one in the world. And so that kind of speaks to not only the quality of the students that are admitted, um, but also the innovative research that's coming out of this college and the different programs that it offers and the different research opportunities that even undergraduates can get involved with. 
um, in terms of innovation and research, there's actually 16 elements on the, on the periodic table of elements that have been discovered at UC Berkeley. The two of them named after us, two of them, the two of them being Berkelium and Californium. So look out for those whenever you come across a periodic table of elements anytime soon and know that it's named after us. There, if you've taken any chemistry class, you've also, you've also probably heard of the Lewis dot structure. I remember I did as a, as a wee little high schooler. And that Lewis dot structure was actually something that a professor, that Professor Lewis uh, came up with at UC Berkeley when teaching the intro chemistry class, Chem 1A. Um, and so that's just a fun fact about the university. Um, I also know that the, a lot of the intro chemistry courses have been some of my friends' favorite classes, even with remote learning. And so this college is just doing a really great job at making sure that their students still feel supported, even though the content and the and the level of academics in this college is really can be difficult. So that's just great to know. And then we're gonna go on to our last college, College of Engineering, which I believe Bridget will be done. Yeah, so our last college, as Mo just said, is the College of Engineering. And now this is a pretty cool place to be. I have a lot of friends in the College of Engineering and they will never stop talking about how proud they are to be there and how great their education is and how excited they are to be learning under the staff. Um, it is home to about 3,800 students and has 11 majors. Uh, some things really quickly just about the College of Engineering. I know there are some Cal parents out there. You do have to apply directly to this college. Uh, so when you're applying, you have to specifically state that you want to join the College of Engineering and what major you are interested in. But then also, just so you're not enveloped in that STEM world, there are some humanities and social sciences breath classes that you are required to take to kind of make sure that you don't forget how to write a paper or anything important like that. And of course, there are also some technical courses which are very applic applicable and super interesting to be in, so I've heard. Uh, if you are interested to learn a little bit more about our engineering college, there is a separate engineering tour that Campus Ambassadors do host on Thursdays. Those happen throughout the rest of the year. It's not just a homecoming thing. So make sure to check those out if you do wanna learn more. And then really quickly, the motto of this college is to transform the lives of our students by preparing them to become successful leaders and innovators for positive change. And that wraps up all of our undergraduate colleges. And moving on to our graduate schools, um, you can see a big long list of our different graduate schools here. But in addition to this list, different departments on and from different colleges will also offer their own graduate programs. So there's more than what this list offers. Um, but just to go down the line, the first one is the Hall School of Business. They actually even offer an undergraduate program uh, for business administration. Um, and they also offer one for global management, biology and business, and an MET, management, entrepreneur, technology program. There is also a graduate school for education, information, a law school, social wel welfare, optometry, um, and there's also a school of journalism, public health, and public policy. We're going to be talking a little bit more about these graduate schools later on in the webinar. We're going to move on to academics and the structure of our classes um, and our class sizes. All right, so just to introduce you guys to that, um, when it comes to structure and class sizes, we have our classes are divided into lecture and discussion. So you have lecture, which is the huge class with all the students who have signed up to take the course. And then you have discussion, which is this really awesome thing that Berkeley does where a graduate student instructor, more commonly known as a GSI, will lead a group of 10 to 20 students in like a bonus class where you get to work specifically on like practice problems or get help on writing your papers, going over material more thoroughly. Uh, this just lets students kind of get a smaller tight knit community within these big classes and also it gives you some one on one time with an instructor that you might not get in a class of like a million people as some classes here are. Um, what's interesting actually is that we have an 18 to 1 student to faculty ratio, so you would think that with such a big school we wouldn't have uh, such a small ratio, but there are a lot of there are a lot of cool faculty members here and they make up, uh, even though it's 18 students to every one faculty member, they handle it very well. And 85% of our classes are fewer than 50 students. So you might be picturing as I did, these giant lecture halls with 3000 students all with laptops and fancy projections on the walls, but that's not what it is. 85% of the time, uh, the smallest class that I've ever been in was actually 10 students. And it was one of my favorite classes that I've taken so far. Uh, but then, of course, there are still those big classes that you still can get involved in if that's what you want your college experience to look like. And then when it comes to resources, there are a lot of things open to the students here on campus, even with 
uh, COVID making everything online, these are still available to all students. We have office hours, which are where the, the professors and the graduate students essentially have a set time where you can meet with them to get extra help on whatever it is you may need. We have the Student Learning Center, the SLC, which is a really cool resource for students where you can go and get tutored by your peers. So these are students who have taken that class in the past and they have come back out of the goodness of their own hearts to help out students who are desperately struggling in Logic 12a. I mean, any class that you might be taking at the time. And then of course we have individual advising. So you have your college advisor and then you have your major advisor. Uh, my major advisor, her name is Janet and she is the most wonderful person in the entire world. These advisors, they help you get into the classes that they, you need. They give you academic advice. Uh, anything that you might need, they're there to help you. So if you do, if you have a student here, definitely make, encourage them to reach out to their individual advisor because they are the best people on the face of the earth. That's a great point. I also love my advisor has helped me plan everything. If you have any questions about your advisor, academics, um, housing, or our personal experiences as students, um, or how we're coping with remote learning as we're gonna be talking about later on. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to use the Q&A button. We have a whole group of campus ambassadors like us that are ready and so excited to answer your questions. Um, in addition to the real time, question answering situation that we have going on. Bridget and I will also be doing a Q&A session at the end. Um, so please ask away in your questions because real life people like us will be responding and we really wanna hear your questions. But with that being said, we're gonna talk a little bit more about remote learning and how the semester has been like for us as the fall semester so far has been fully remote um, and there's been goals of hybridization um, for kind of this semester, but that would only be in line with the CDC guidelines and has not really happened so far. Um, so from at least for me, all of my classes, labs, everything has been remote. Um, and this, when I, to clarify a little bit more about remote, that means that our homeworks are all online on a, on a different program. Um, and we also use Zoom Pro. And so we're able to host our own meetings for our own student clubs and also have all the different features for Zoom for our classes to do discussion groups, to do smaller groups so where we can talk with our peers in a big lecture and just to touch base with different students. Um, classes, there are also two different types of classes, synchronous and asynchronous. And synchronous means that the lectures are pretty much always hosted on a live Zoom. So you're meant to be there at a certain time and you're able to ask questions live to the professors, just like you can ask us questions right now. And asynchronous means that the lectures are already pre-recorded. And so students can watch um, the lecture and keep up with the course content on their own time. And this just depends on the professor and the different the nature of the course. Um, in terms of different resources that we have as students right now, there is the Student Learning Center's tutoring services have just continued on just virtually. And so there's different drop-in hours. Our academic advisors also have drop-in hours and different departments and different student development resources all have different drop-in hours. There is also a specific, specific set of classes called Semester in the Cloud, and these are designed um, to be remote. Um, and so this just means that they utilize a bunch of different features on the Canvas, a program in which a lot of our classes are stored, and they just really take into consideration the remote setting into the, the structure of the class and the types of assignments. And so the friends that I have that have taken Semester in the Cloud courses have said that it's been really easy to stay engaged, and it's one where the structure and the integral part of the class really takes into account the fact that people are doing it on their own time and remote. If you have any questions about any more specifics on how we think remote learning is like, or especially because the spring semester is expected to start, at least, at least start remotely, please feel free to put that in the Q&A Q section. So next up, we are gonna talk about housing and dining. All right, so uh, just to point out, kind of trailing off of the last slide, Housing is a little bit different now because of COVID and all of the um, precautions that we are taking. So we're gonna go over both sides to that. As you should see, a poll is now popping up asking where you or your student uh, got to live while you were at Cal. I got to live in both units three and unit two. So that's probably twice as many places as you lived, not to brag or anything. Uh, but take to take a look at typical housing, we have residence, residential halls and suites. So these are just two different styles of dorms. The residential halls, like what I lived in, unit two and three, also unit one in Blackwell. These are your high rise buildings that have long hallways with dorms and one shared bathroom, while the suites are like tiny little houses within a larger building where it's one common area with a bunch of doubles attached to it and then 
eight students or so share a bathroom. Um, I can see that a lot of you guys were off campus. I'm currently off campus and it is one of the coolest things that I've done so far. Uh, when you do live on campus, there are a lot of really cool resources for our students. There are the residential assistants, RAs. These are the most kind-hearted people that you've ever met. Upperclassmen who decide to live in the dorms once more to help freshmen or incoming students uh, just with day-to-day -day life if they need help academically or just want someone to talk to. They're really cool people. One of my best friends is an RA and he loves his job. He does his best to make all of his residents feel welcomed and at home, which is super, super cool to see. There are also theme programs which are scattered throughout the different dorms. In unit three, I lived above the LGBTQ plus pride floor. It was a really cool program to kind of watch from afar. It was a really, this is a really great way to build a community with inside the dorms. You kind of just check off what you're interested in. And then all of a sudden you're placed with all these people who have the same values or are interested in the same thing. And it's a great way to make friends right off the bat. There are also common areas for students to go within the dorms uh, to hang out, get work done, kind of socialize on their floor all that fun stuff. And then of course, the best part, there is a meal plan included. We have four different um, dining halls that you can go to scattered throughout the different dorms. I've been to all of them and I can say that they're all pretty great. As for housing during COVID, uh, the protocols that we're following currently are they everyone has a single room. You have to wear a face mask in the hallways or anywhere that isn't your own personal space. And we have these things which are called social pods, which are essentially the, the reduced floor mates all get to hang out together because they're sharing a bathroom and like spending all this time together to begin with. So this just makes sure that these students aren't going crazy in self isolation. They still have friends. They still have people that they can talk to that isn't just uh, their reflection in the mirror because at the beginning of COVID I was there and that was not fun. So shout out to the dorms for fixing that. That is the only point I have to say with that is that yes, housing is very important in the student life. And I myself am living in that off campus apartment right now um, and that has, being able to customize my own space is very different from the freshman year dorm experience. Um, but to talk, to talk about different student housing, housing options, one of them being off campus housing, um, there is this whole list of different places you can live. The first one being you could continue to live in a dorm. You could also live at the International House, which is in the top left photo, top, top left of the screen. Um, and it is one that offers housing to a lot of international students, but anyone is, a, is allowed to apply to live there. Their, their food that they offer is all really, really good. They have kombucha on tap, they have kimchi, like they just have the most culturally relevant foods. Um, there's also different affiliated proper, properties where a lot of UC Berkeley students or staff live in. There's also the option of off-campus apartments or to live in a co-op, which is typically a big house with a bunch of different people and usually UC Berkeley students, um, but you get a lower reduced rent in, in exchange for doing different duties and having taking on some responsibility in the house, whether it be cooking or cleaning or other activities like a garden manager. Um, there's also the option to live in a sorority or fraternity. Um, and that's another way to get housing throughout the years and kind of switch up your living community and meet new different friends. Um, there's also, regardless of whether you're living in a dorm, you also have the option to get a meal plan if you're not, if you just want to have your meals already taken care of for you. Um, and if you want to find out more about different housing options and what you, housing is very important. But if you just want more information, there is a website, housing.berkeley.edu, where you can check out more details. All right, so moving forward, we're gonna talk a little bit about health and safety, which is very relevant at the moment. Uh, the university has some really great health services. So as you can see listed here, the different resources, we have urgent care, primary care, uh, physical therapy. These are all available through the Tang Center, which is our, uh, our health service here on campus. It is very close to the dorms. It was like a two minute walk from when I lived in unit three, which was very helpful, very resourceful. Uh, we have our student's health insurance plan or the SHIP program. Students are not required to have SHIP, but it is a really great resource. It gets you a lot of uh, discounted prices and other things that are very intimidating as a, for a student who has never had to think about health insurance before. Uh, because of COVID, we have different COVID testing and tracing programs. There are different places you can go on campus to get tested. Uh, something that I didn't mention when talking about living in the dorms is that they are actually required to get COVID tested twice a week. So this is just to make sure that everyone is staying safe. Uh, we're not causing some outbreak. And then also it helps with all the COVID research that's going on in the background of our campus. And then of course, there are a lot of FAQs, webinars, and tips going around uh, that are available to Cal parents and alumni, just like you guys, uh, to keep you guys updated on what's happening on our campus. 
We also have uh, psychological counseling, which is a really amazing resource. And again, this is online as well. So students aren't missing out on that. And we have the Path to Care, which is a confidential resource for survivors of sexual violence and sexual harassment. It is an amazing resource. They provide a lot of help to anyone who may need it. And just to emphasize it, it is confidential. So you don't have to be afraid of putting your face on something that you don't wanna be a part of. Uh, we also have the Optometry Eye Center, which is run by our, our Graduate School of Optometry. This is a really great place to go if you need to get your eyes checked. It's fun to yell at referees at any sporting event that they need to go to the Optometry Center when they call a bad call. I personally really need to go to the Optometry Center. I can't see very well these days, so I need to get my eyes checked. And that's just, I'm really grateful to have that resource here on campus. It makes it a lot easier for students to get any medical help that they need, even if that's just getting your eyes checked. And then of course, something really important is that Berkeley has a lot of stress relief programs that students have available to them. There are paws for mental health, which is my personal favorite. These are just puppies on campus that you can go up to and pet, kind of take a break from the world around you and just get puppy kisses and feel a lot better. And then one of our more well-known uh, stress relief programs is Llama Palooza. This is where llamas are brought onto Memorial Glade the week of finals. And you can go up and if you look at the picture on the top right, you can take pictures with them, you can pet them, you can feed them. It is quite a bizarre experience. I am a little sad that it's we can't have it in person this year, you know, llamas and spitting, that's not really great. But what's cool is that actually one of my housemates is actually trying to make a virtual substitute. So he's working really hard to give us virtual llamas, which is really awesome to see that students are still very passionate about making sure that no one's stressed out and that everyone gets to pet a llama if they need to. All right, and on to campus safety services. Um, so Berkeley is a city and so we take the campus and the university just takes safety and really seriously make sure that we have different resources in order to increase our security and increase our safety. Um, the first resource being the UC Police Department that is located on campus. And one of the biggest ways that they connect to us as students is by offering the blue light poles, which is the photo on the bottom left. And there are over 100 of these stationed either on campus or in nearby neighborhoods. And the idea is that at any time of the day or night, at any day in the year, you can press this button on the station and within two minutes, a UC Police Department officer will be at that location. And I think this is really useful, especially if you don't have your phone on you um, or you don't have another way to communicate or ask for help. And so this is just a really great resource to keep in mind and to just kind of remember where your resources and your telephone poles are when you're out on campus. There's also a resource called Warn Me in which you get a email notification um, whenever there is an immediate concern in the community, um, whether it be anything like a coyote or like wildfire news. The most residence halls also have a free point security system. So that means that you need a key to get into the building. You need a key to get in, you need a, your key card to get into the elevator and you also need your own key to get into your room. Um, there's also two night services that are really, really important. I think, especially when considering again, that Berkeley is a city. So first we have a night safety shuttle, which is a free shuttle. All you need is your Cal ID card and you just hop on at night um, in order to and get home. Um, there's a specific route that takes us all around the campus and definitely hits up all the residence halls. So when I lived at Clark Kerr, which is the farthest dorm from campus, I rode this all the time. There's also a program called Bear Walk in which UC Police Department trained officers um, will walk you from door to door. And so whether this is a building on campus to another building or if it's to your to your apartment or to your car or parking lot structure, this is another way to ensure safety and increase the safety of our students. All right, to talk a little bit more about student resources, which I hope you guys have picked up. There are a lot of them here. Uh, we have a lot for student development. So there's a lot of resources for identity and community. So we have the Centers for Educational Justice and Community Engagement, the Associated Students of the University of California, the ASUC, which is our student government. There's the Transfer Student Center, the Undocumented Student Center, and so many more uh, that just helps students find a smaller community within the campus. If they need to someone to reach out to, this is the place to go. Uh, and if you identify as anything, I promise you there is a place for you here on our campus, which is super fun, super fresh to see. As for support and equity, we have the Disabled Students Program and the Basic Needs Center. So students of any variety can get, again, the help that they need. And there are so, so many more. This slide honestly could take up 
like 10,000 slides just because of how great Berkeley is at providing resources to their students and making sure that everyone has an outlet, everyone has any resources that they may need. And it's really cool to just see the students who are part of these programs and then the faculty who help run these programs all come together to create these little communities. And it's just so, so cool to see. All right. And beyond our, our academics that UC Berkeley students are so dedicated to, we also have a life and we also enjoy different, doing different things in the, with our day and on the weekends. And so this may be one of the ways that students may spend their time may be being part of some of the 1,000 plus re registered student organizations or clubs that we have on campus. This includes cultural clubs, or cult clubs that are more centered around an activity like the ski club or ones that are more based on a career path um, like pre-med students. So there's a bunch of different types of clubs to get involved with or start on your own. Um, students are also really involved in volunteering, whether it be fundraising for a local cause or far away or direct service. Um, there's also different jobs they can get on campus. Um, being a campus ambassador is the job that we have on campus. There's also, I also work at the Berkeley Food Institute and work at the Green Initiative Fund. And so all three of these are different jobs, on campus jobs that I have been able to connect with through the Career Center or different major newsletters. Um, that, that just refers to newsletters that my major sends out specifically. Students can also get involved with different internships, especially considering we are so close to San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. Um, students also get involved in study abroad. I plan to study abroad in some capacity and sometime during my college experience, hopefully. Um, there's also a lot to explore in the Bay Area, whether it be going, to your, going back to like a friend's hometown or different cities in the Bay Area. There's just endless things to do in San Francisco. Um, there's also a bunch of museums and a, and a theater near our campus. And there's a bunch of different ways to um, enjoy your life beyond academics at UC Berkeley. All right, to continue forward into some um, remote resources when it comes to building a community, we have a really cool list here. Uh, we have another poll popping up asking you guys where you're joining us from. I'm actually really intrigued to see a lot of the time on these tours, we just have people from different parts of California. So please let me know if you don't live in the greatest state in the, un in the United States. <laughs> going back to building community, um, there's a lot going on to make sure that students stay involved. Um, even though everything is online, these range from social media networking to different clubs and organizations, uh, putting all of their events online. For example, our homecoming rally was just all virtual. Usually it happens on Memorial Glade in front of our Doe Library, but this year everything was on Zoom and we had different virtual performances and such. I hope some of you guys at least got to see it because it was really, really cool to watch. Um, Outside of student clubs and organizations, we have department webinars. So there are also professional and personal development opportunities still happening on our campus. We have different guest lecturers uh, that still come along again, all over Zoom. So it's nice and safe, but it's cool to see uh, it's still persevering through these trying times. I see that you guys are all from California. So good job for living here. <laughs> and then finally, the last thing uh, that we have that was put online was actually our golden bear orientation. So if you have a new student this year, you should know that they went through a golden bear or or orientation, which is our orientation program for new students. It was all online. In fact, I was the only person in my house who wasn't an orientation leader this, this year. And so I can tell you that it went very, very well. And a lot of students still got that really unique ex orientation experience that Berkeley provides, even though it was still over Zoom. And on to athletics, there's three different ways that three different levels in which students can get involved with athletics here. The first one being division one, very intense, very professional athletes. Second, we have club in which you still compete with other other schools and other groups. There's also students that just get involved for fun, the intramural groups. Um, in addition to these more structured groups, students can also have a healthy life balance, a healthy lifestyle and get active by utilizing resources like the gyms that we have on different campus, on, all over campus, as well as different basketball gyms and other recreational um, events and different lessons um, because we, the, part of our tuition and part of our student experience is having access to those free uh, PE kind of classes and physical education classes. A little fun fact is that UC Berkeley has actually won 207 Olympic medals um, and so that's just a little flex that we have about our athletic community.
All right, and so to look in a little bit to libraries and research, we have 24 official libraries on campus, which is really great. You can basically study in a new place every day. Um, my favorite library is the Howison Philosophy Library. It is one of our smaller libraries on campus, but it is by far the best one in every single aspect. Uh, pictured on the slide, you can see Doe Library, which is our most iconic library. It's the main library here on campus, right in the middle. It's very beautiful. I'm sure if you've ever looked into UC Berkeley, you've definitely seen a picture of Doe Library. To the right of it, you can see the Moffitt Undergraduate Library. There are no books inside of it, so it confuses me and why to as to why it's a library, but it's a really great study space. Between these 24 libraries, we have over 13 million different volumes. So this is just mind boggling to, if you think about it. There are so many different academic sources that are available, available to us as students, and they're all still available to us online. So it doesn't even matter if you're on campus, you still have this really great uh, these really great library resources. And then of course we have extensive research both that is now transitioned to online as well. So all of this is still happening on our campus. To look at research a little bit more, we have the Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program or URAP as it is more commonly referred to. This is where most students get involved in research, but this is not the only place uh, that you have to go if that is something that you want to pursue. There are also different depart departmental opportunities. So you can go straight to professors or your department, uh, whatever you may be interested in. And a lot of students do get involved in research. Uh, it's something that I've looked into, but I am currently too afraid to apply to. But it's a really great opportunity that our undergraduates here have, have access to that not a lot of undergraduates across the US actually have. Yes. Okay. Sorry. That was a little technical difficulty there in terms of campus highlights. We are both a mix of urban cityscape as well as different nature elements throughout our campus. And this is seen in either our squirrels, our close access to hiking trails, a beautiful strawberry creek that runs through our campus as well as eucalyptus grove. Um, this slide just kind of shows how we get the best of both worlds as, as we get the access to a city, but also the beautiful nature elements of our campus. All right, so we'll be moving back into the Q&A now. So we'll be going ahead and answering some of your questions live. So for our first question, this is from Gloria, who asks, if either of you are considering a gap semester or a gap year because of distance learning or otherwise, why or why not? Mo, do you want to start us off? Yes, um, I think this decision on on, gap, on taking some time off really depends on each student's like schedule. Um, courses courses wise um, I know for myself and also just kind of the different resources that that they would be spending their time with um, at least for this summer and this fall and this this whole year pretty much I have decided to stay enrolled and stay in school mostly because first of all I'm an international student so I had to be enrolled in classes in order to be in America but also I am I have in-person research on campus and I also help run one of the farms at UC Berkeley um, and so I had in-person activities, extracurriculars, research um, that I wanted to do. And that kind of structure aligned with also having a course schedule and having a course course and like that kind of structured life. And so that's why it made sense to do like also have this research and work and also take classes. Um, next fall though, I do plan to take a semester off. Not really sure about the university's plans all the way far away, but this is because I just personally don't have a lot of fall semester classes I'm excited about and um, don't imagine everything in the US to be settled down yet. And so that's kind of how I'm balancing and deciding whether where I want to be is based on what research is, what beyond classes would I be doing um, and which classes would I be wanting to take online? Those are all different factors that kind of helped guide my decision. I know a lot of students, um, even like my housemates, a lot of them didn't have in-person activities, but the reason why they continue to do online school is because they wanted that structure. They wanted a lot of the internships and the jobs that they want in the future require these lower division classes, require getting a base understanding of a certain industry or certain subject. And so just like going to school, despite um, the conditions was just something that they needed in their life right now. Um, and I also think just being in Berkeley, being in the college town, being around college students um, also just kind of creates the illusion that we are back in a normal time and just living the college experience. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things to consider whether or not you want to take a gap year or a gap semester off. But 
I think ultimately what it comes down to is, you know, you got to weigh the cost and benefits of whatever you want to do. And ultimately, I think it will be the right decision at the end of the day. Just got to spend some time to think about it. All right. So for our next question, one of our viewers was wondering how have we've been doing with distance learning, whether we're on campus and how's that going for us? Bridget, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I would love to talk about this. So as I very briefly mentioned uh, during the tour, I am on campus. Technically, I live about two blocks away from the entrance of our campus. Uh, so it's been nice to be up in Berkeley instead of in my home in Southern California, where it is probably 10,000 degrees every single day. Uh, I really like being up here. Part of the reason that, uh, to kind of answer the last question, part of the reason that I decided to continue with this distance learning is to be up in Berkeley with my friends and have that structure in my life that Mo was talking about. Um, as for the experience, I can't lie, it's a little difficult at times. I am a very distracted person. I'm like always fiddling with something in my hands. I'm currently playing with the lid to a candle as I'm talking to you guys. Uh, so it can be it can be tough, but at the same time, Berkeley is doing such a great job at helping its students stay engaged, helping us stay connected. Uh, I'm very I could I still find myself to be very motivated uh, to do well in my classes. I the hardest part is just sitting at my desk all day. Zoom can be very draining, but the information that I'm learning and just the content that I'm absorbing every single day kind of makes it worth it. Uh, so the days can be long and the days can be tiring, but in the end, I'm still getting that Berkeley education that I initially came here for. So in the end, I find myself excited to go to my Zoom classes because it's this is my college experience and I have to make the most of it uh, regardless, of, regardless of, of what's happening around me. So to kind of sum up that sporadic answer, distance learning has its pros and its cons, but for the most part, it's been, it's been, it's been an interesting experience and it's kind of cool to be a part of something that's never happened before, uh, but it's not as bad as the media may paint it to be. Yeah, I think despite the difficulties of online learning, I know it's not for everyone. I do think that with every day, the university is continuously refining and improving on the general processes of how that's going to go. So I think that's it's a work in progress, but I think we're making lots of progress every day. Okay, so moving on to our next question. So one of our viewers' children is a freshman distance learning at home, and they're worried that he's not getting the social interaction that college normally provides. So what are some things he can do to connect with fellow students? Uh, Mo, do you want to take that one? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think the first thing that I thought about is First, the resource of just like different discussion groups in, within classes. I'd say all of my classes try to utilize this function of like creating breakout rooms during class. And so while sometimes I'll be in a breakout room where like everyone doesn't, no one has their camera on or like there is very minimal speaking, but I think taking the initiative to like try a camera and like just kind of put yourself out there and like you guys are all in a class together. So there's already a common basis to like work together on a project or talk about the course content. I think there's just a lot of opportunity there um, while people try to adjust to like socializing online. Um, I also think that a big area in which you can socialize is all the different student clubs because seniors have left, because continued students, some of them may not even be enrolled because of the online semester. I'd say all clubs are struggling and wanting students to join, especially freshmen. Um, and so it's easier than ever to get into some of those competitive clubs, but even like the more regular clubs that don't accept applications, they all really want new students. Um, I know in particular, the Student Environmental Resource Center, CERC has been hosting a bunch of different events for people remotely interested in any environmental issues. Um, you could also join different consulting groups, or if you have a passion with like digital design, a lot of these passion or activity based clubs are now hosting workshops. Um, and so this is a great way to like talk about your interests and a common passion and then be able to work together to like create content for other people. And so this is one way that I think a lot of clubs have been able to transition online. Um, and I think it's hard to do like just socialize for no reason on Zoom. I think that's why this club structure is really good because it's a collection of people who are pulled together by a certain passion. And then with this common base of knowledge, you're able to like socialize and work and make friends. Um, and so I think just like really researching and figuring out what you're interested in, what skills you have, what whether it's plants or bugs or an activity or a sport, whatever it may be, just like looking into those clubs and what's out there and what communities are out there at Berkeley is a really great option, I think, to make friends. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think clubs are such a great way to get in touch with other people, even in these socially distanced times. I think it's great just meeting a lot of people with similar interests, and I think it's a good way to stay connected. Okay, so what is the most fun class you have taken outside of your major? Mo, do you want to take that one? Yes, real quickly. Most fun class is called Food in the Environment. It was about the intensification of agriculture and how agriculture actually relates to everything like the birth of inequality, taxes, capitalism, and just like every, a lot of the problems that we see now today have to do with agriculture and how also agriculture changes, changed our human anatomy. This class actually made me really more interested in food and agriculture. So I didn't expect for this to, uh, this was just more a requirement that was for my, one of my, my major, but it actually ended up impacting my understanding of how much food and agriculture matters in a lot of the underlying issues we have in our society. Sounds like a pretty fun class. All right, so moving on to our final question of the Q&A. Why Berkeley? What made you guys want to apply here and choose to come here for the next four years? Bridget, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I would love to. So I ended up choosing Berkeley actually because of an Instagram post uh, that I saw right before that I applied, which is a very, very strange thing to tell people. I remember in person when I would say that I would get some very strange looks, uh, but it's the truth. Uh, I remember when I was looking at colleges, I knew that if I wasn't happy inside of my academics, I wouldn't be happy outside of them. So I really wanted to find a school that had a lot of spirit, a lot, uh, some spirit organization that I could be a part of. I was definitely an ASB kid in high school. So I wanted something kind of like that, that I could cling on to in college. And then one day I was like, should I apply to UC Berkeley? And my teacher was like, don't be stupid, apply to Berkeley, go look at their social media, see what they're all about. So I was just perusing the Instagram when I saw this girl, Allison, firing a cannon. And I said, oh my gosh, that's something I definitely need to do. So looking into it, I found the UC Rally Committee, which I am now a very, very proud member of. And I said, I need to apply to this school just because of this cannon. That's not entirely true. Berkeley has so many really great qualities as to why I applied, but it was the canon that really pushed me over the edge. And when I got in, I accepted that I accepted that offer immediately. And then the first thing I did when I stepped on campus was I started searching for that rally committee table. And I found it within like two weeks. And then two months later, actually, this is crazy today, a year ago today, I fired that cannon twice. So it was a very full circle moment. It was like I was surrounded by Cal spirit and some of my best friends. And I was like, wow, this is why I'm here. And I feel like that's just a testament to why Berkeley is so great is because there's something for everyone, whether that be as niche as firing a cannon or something more broad, which is like literally anything else. But that is why I chose Berkeley and I fired a cannon because of it. <laughs> I am just gonna go ahead and also share my Berkeley story. Um, I actually did not plan to go to UC Berkeley. I was actually committed to two other universities before going here. Had a lot of different obstacles when I was trying to figure out what college I could go to. Um, but the reason why Berkeley wasn't really on my radar and where I expected to go is because there isn't any food related major or anything about rural development or um, poverty alleviation, which is what I was interested in. Um, and so that's why I wasn't really on my radar. But as soon as I figured out that I would be going to Berkeley, I reached out to my major advisor and I was like, here's what I wanna do. Here's what I'm interested in. Here's the type of research I would wanna do. Like, is there anything for me at this university? And within one day, my academic advisor responded being like, here are faculty you can talk to. Here's the classes you can take. Here are different student clubs you can join. Here's this student organic garden. Here are these different farms that you can work at. Just like all the full list of resources that are not only just academic and career oriented, but also extracurriculars and in terms of community. And so this spoke to two things for me. The first one being the fact that the academic advisors knew students really well. They knew what our lives look like beyond just course schedules and course numbers on online and different forms. It also showed that she actually, my academic advisor, advisor actually knew what we do their day and how you, your passions can be really integrated into other corners of your life and really develop them. Um, it also showed to me that beyond the things that are on the Berkeley website, um, there are so many different passions and different type of people on campus and they all have different um, knowledge and different pockets of knowledge and experiences. And so 
and they're all doing different things on campus. I was able to get involved without a food major or an agriculture major at this school. I was still able to get ag experience, ag work, ag research. And so this just speaks to the fact that no matter who you are and what interests you may or may not have yet, there is a community of people really passionate about that and really knowledgeable about that on this campus as well. Um, and so no matter you, especially in college when people's interests change or they're not really sure what they want to do or even if you are really sure what to do regardless of where you are on that spectrum there are people on this campus who want to talk to you about your passions and just like talk about you and your life and what they do um, and so that I think just speaks to how UC Berkeley is for anyone um, and so there's just a bunch of different people on this campus waiting for you to come through and to talk about your passions and talk about what you're interested in. And so I think that's really awesome about the diverse set of experiences and knowledge that is on this campus. All right, thank you guys so much for sharing your Berkeley stories. And I hope for the alumni that are joining us, they'll be able to remind, be reminded of their own Berkeley stories. And for the Cal parents and families that are joining us, they'll be able to think about their own child's or family member's Berkeley stories. I really think it's such a great thing. Okay, so moving to our final moment. Just wanted to share a couple quick resources for you to stay in touch with us. So make sure to follow us on social media at Visit UC Berkeley. If you're interested in going on a camp campus tour, then go on to visit.berkeley.edu. Also, if you're interested in checking out one of the recordings of our campus visits or a student panel, then go on to our YouTube channel at Visit UC Berkeley. Also make sure to check out the rest of our homecoming events at homecoming.berkeley.edu or in your guidebook app. Also, we are celebrating 150 years of women at Berkeley. So go ahead and check that out at 150w.berkeley.edu. And finally, if you're interested in hearing more of our student perspectives, then go ahead and check out the Bear Talk blog at beartalk.berkeley.edu. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to invite our other ambassadors to join me in a quick Go Bears on one, two, and three. Go Bears! Go Bears. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Happy homecoming. <laughs>